And now, our feature presentation. Dimensional travel gives you a crick in the neck and mm, everywhere else, apparently. Shoot, where am I? Oh, thank goodness I'm home. That was not worth it. Never doing that again. Unless, oh geez, I hope I have the thing I even went for. <sighs> All for this thing. <sighs> All this work for one little amiibo. Jeez. Well, at least I got off Scott free. Wait a second. That's not my car. dimension. I have no idea what I'm getting into here. Mini, scout. Where would I be without you, Mini? Whoa! Drone guards. Of course he's got drone guards. Remind me to never double cross this guy. I'm in a parallel dimension. I knew it! Oh, stupid amiibo. Okay, okay, what do I even do? I, I don't even know if dimensional travel is a thing in this dimension yet, which means I am 100% stuck here. Well, okay, I, I can't just, I can't just waltz up to my dimensional copy and be like, oh, hi. I got stuck in a dimension because I stole an amiibo from another one. Hey, just can't we just figure this out between friends? No, that's not how it works. Okay. You're gonna have to find an inn. And the only way to find an inn is figure out what he wants. Uh, maybe uh, we can make a trade or there's gotta be something we have in common. Uh, it's just a dimensional alt. Basically, there's there's got to be something that he needs that I can get him. The only way I'm going to know that is if I break in. Okay. Let's do this. Thank you. 
device can play some form of Tetris. And you can say that it exists. Everybody's played a Tetris at some point, and if you haven't, or you've heard of it now, you're welcome. You can't beat the classic block dropping formula. Just look at all these imitators who've tried to. Oh. Tetris, but sometimes I want to play Tetris without actually playing Tetris, you know? Like, the good old-fashioned games are quite too addictive fun, but even just a single extra mechanic can go a long way to spice things up. And I think that's why I've always been interested in the... And I think that's why I'm always interested in the idea Guys, has anybody seen Tetris Axis? <sighs> I think I've gotten paranoid. Uh, where did I put that game? That was too close. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait, did he say Tetris Axis? if I no longer want to use my eyes to see, but then I wouldn't be able to play Tetris anymore. So, instead, why not just play Tetris on a console that has 3D and doesn't hurt my eyes? Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks, Cosmo. Hello, world. My name is Denominator. I know what you're thinking. Why is he being so serious? Well, yeah, I know. Normally, I'd like to start off with a segue or a joke or something and try to be clever. But uh, today, I wanted to do something a little different. As we all know, games are a visual medium. They can build incredible worlds, tell amazing stories, and develop interesting characters. Now, the thing about video games is they're a little more involved than just watching something on the television. Usually you control the character or influence the world in some way, and thus there are a lot of stories in video games that simply go untold. And even for people like me who play video games, a lot of those stories are just never found because we don't know those games exist. Uh, one of my favorite obscure video game stories is that of Chibi Robo, an obscure franchise published and developed by Skip and Nintendo. Two companies, one you've probably heard of, and the other you've probably never heard of. Now the thing about these games is the story goes a lot deeper than just a bunch of games released on a bunch of consoles. When you look on the other side, you'll find a convoluted and confusing development history, tons of roadblocks and issues along the way keeping the games from success, and sometimes it's actually a little sad. In the 15 years that this series has existed, it's incredible how many setbacks it's seen. And that's the other half of the story that makes this whole thing so interesting to me. So, why? Why would I put in all the work to review a series of games that nobody played? Well, that's exactly it. I may be sub 300 subscribers or whatever the number is, but frankly, I don't care. If I can tell one person about this series, then I think it's worth it. It's been 15 years since Chibi Robo Plug Into Adventure on the GameCube was released here in North America. That's insane. All the things that have happened in that time are what make this series what it is and why I love it so much. There's a lot of ground to cover, but I'm excited and I am most certainly ready to finally do this. So, are you ready? Here goes. Let's begin. Get ready to Robo. Some say the Chibi Robo series was never meant to succeed. Many don't even know that any other games outside of the first one exist, and many think that it was pure coincidence that sealed his fate. But as for me, I know the truth. I know that what happened to Chibi Robo was no pure accident. And diving deeper into the history of the series, may reveal one of Nintendo's best-kept secrets. This is a story about tragedy, overcoming, despair, and hope. This is Chibi Robo! Our story begins with a little company called Nintendo. The GameCube era. While not an especially financially successful time for Nintendo, it was definitely seen as one of their most creative. The GameCube may not have been one of Nintendo's biggest, but it was almost certainly one of their best. So many franchises found new life here, and a whole bunch of new ones were created in the process. Among these bigger titles were plenty of smaller ones made by various teams, including a little-known developer called Skip. Certainly not a household name, but what Skip was missing in popularity, it made up for in a handful of some of the most creative games I've ever seen. And better yet, they might as well have had an exclusivity deal with Nintendo, since the Big N was the company to publish almost all of their games. And to be honest, I can't think of a better fit. If Skip is known for anything, it's for making incredibly unique games that take creative twists on different genres. Their library, while somewhat on the small side, is super diverse, and each title has something different to offer. From the bite-sized arcade-style Bit Generation series on the Game Boy Advance, to their more large-scale projects like Giftpia and Captain Rainbow. 
Thank goodness I'm able to play these games in my region legally. Yeah, so a lot of these games never came out in America, or、uh, any place besides Japan. While fan made translations for a lot of these games have been made over the years, and some can be played without reading any English, there is still a fair portion of Skip's library that has never been localized. That's one of the reasons Skip wasn't all that well known, but the other issue is that the company's identity is, well, foggy to say the least. See, Skip never stuck with one idea for very long. Besides a few of their previous games being re released on newer hardware with better graphics, most of Skip's game ideas were once and done. On one hand, this makes their library incredibly diverse despite its size. On the other hand, it's kind of hard to identify Skip with just a character, since they didn't have a series or character with multiple entries. Until 2005. Gee, I wonder what series I could be referring to.、Wrong. Chibi Robo is Skip's most consistent series, and by that I mean it has almost no consistency whatsoever. Five games across three consoles, and only two of them are remotely alike. And we haven't even talked about the game that never saw the light of day the beta to the first game on the GameCube. Why? Well, because what we have here are two entirely different games. One that was never released because Shigeru Miyamoto happened. Wait, what? Yeah, so let's back it up here a second. Chibi Robo was initially announced in 2003 and it looked almost nothing like the Chibi Robo we know today, and that's why it's getting its own video. Thanks to the Chibi Robo community, we have a surprising amount of footage and concept art from the early stages of the game, which reveals just how different it was going to be. Instead of a 3D platformer, we have a point and click adventure game, a la those old PC games you used to play. You wouldn't actually play as Chibi Robo, you would influence his actions and help him move around and tell him what to do. And the biggest of all the changes Chibi Robo whistles. This is adorable. I know this might sound like a minor thing to point out, but I do think making Chibi Robo a completely silent protagonist was a positive change. And I'll get into that more in the Plug Into Adventure episode. The most interesting thing about Chibi Robo, in my opinion, is the design. It actually barely changed from the initial concept art, and it feels so in sync with a character you'd see in a Nintendo game. He just fits. Let's kick things off with a look at the story, which is also entirely different from the final game. A brilliant scientist is developing a robot that can apparently think for himself. This news catches the ears of two burglars named Cookie and Arnie. Now they want him for themselves. So now the professor is training the robot, our very own Chibi Robo, to defend his house from the burglars and help him learn and improve his skills along the way. Honestly, this concept is super cool, and a part of me wishes we'd gotten a Chibi Robo game that revisited this idea. There's a variety of gameplay mechanics that are completely different here, but I was honestly surprised how many things stayed consistent. The most important parts are actually still here. Chibi Robo is battery powered, and he has to constantly plug into charge or collect batteries to keep himself running. An early version of the Chibi House, Chibi Robo's little home, per se, is also here in the form of a GameCube. Huh, that's certainly an interesting way of going about it. Although, considering that this ended up being re released on the Wii, I suppose that would have looked a little funny. Like I said before, this is a point and click adventure game, which means you spend most of your time showing Chibi where to go and telling him what to do. It might seem like a rather unintuitive way to control a character, but honestly, I kinda like this. Watching from the gameplay footage here, you can see that there's a lot of charming animations and ideas presented, and it's really cool seeing Chibi Robo interact with the world. It makes you feel like you're teaching him things, and you're learning about the house just the same way that he is. This game was indeed planned to be released like this. As a matter of fact, there's a bunch of promotional material that gives us a little more insight on just what this game was going to be. One of the most useful images that turned up recently is this photo from E3 2003, where we actually see a poster about Chibi Robo telling us that there was going to be a lot of different ideas visited here that we never ended up seeing in the final game. Customizing your own Chibi Robo with the help of mod chips. An adaptive personality that changed the more that you interacted with him, and am I reading this right? One to two players. Now, this is the most interesting thing to me. Given that the game was going to revolve around one person moving a camera, I'm really curious how someone was actually going to play along with player one. 
perhaps player 2 would control another chibi robo while player 1 controlled the camera for both? Honestly, I'm having trouble coming up with other ideas here, but still, this is really interesting to me. And honestly, it is kind of a shame that we've never had a multiplayer chibi robo game. Uh, my mind is just buzzing thinking about what we could have done with multiplayer in Plug Into Adventure or Park Patrol on the DS. There isn't much else to say about the actual beta of the game, but we can talk more about some of this early promotional material. A handful of promotional images were released using this poseable Chibi-Robo figure, and while a couple other images have appeared of it online, one still hasn't been found within the community. I tell you, I'd definitely pay some top dollar for this thing, but hey, we got an amiibo out of it, so clearly something came out of the idea. So at this point you may be wondering, what happened to this beta? Well, earlier I mentioned Shigeru Miyamoto. While he's primarily known as Mario's Daddy-O, he's also been a creative head at Nintendo for tons of games over 40 years now. For better or for worse, Miyamoto caught wind of the Chibi-Robo project via another Nintendo producer, Kensuke Tanabe. He took a liking to the character design and saw potential in the character himself, but had a completely different vision for the game that would star him. Thus, he became Chibi-Robo's senior producer, and after a complete overhaul, the game became the 3D platformer we know and love today, and gained the subtitle, Plug Into Adventure. You could definitely call this a happy ending, Chibi-Robo was in the hands of one of Nintendo's most popular creators, but a big part of me still wishes we'd gotten some playable form of this beta outside of the initial footage. Ah well, certainly one of the more frustrating aspects of game development, but at least the project wasn't scrapped entirely. Not to mention, the resulting game is the one that most people think of when they hear the name Chibi-Robo. And that's the game we'll be looking at next time. I hope you'll join me for the next episode of the Chibi-Robo Retrospective, when we at long last plug into adventure. Until then, this is Denominator signing off. See you later, Ominators. Until next video. Alright, the retrospective has begun. I will see you for the next episode. This is gonna be easy.